everybody. This is Dominic D'Angelo of WrestleZone.com. Today's date is January 28th, 2021, and I'm happy to have with me here today, John Schuyler. John, thank you for joining me of episode, I think this will be number four of Meet the Wrestler. So thanks for joining me today, brother. Ironically enough, four is my favorite number. So I'm, I'm honored to be episode number four. How so about thank that? you for having me on. Yeah. Is there a sp specific reason why four is your favorite number? Uh, it just was always my favorite number as a kid. I played high school soccer and everything everything from being a kid all the way through high school my number was always four so hey that's a great lou Gehrig. you can't beat that number brett Favre. i mean geez. uh prescott, prescott yep Dak prescott are you a cowboys so, fan yeah <laughs> oh shit oh shit that's my brother's favorite team it used to be i was i so i started off as a cowboys fan uh yeah. 1990 emmett smith those were my guy emmett zone all that stuff and then yeah. uh later on i became a jets fan i think i made a poor mistake <laughs> Nope. Well, you did this season, so yeah, but I right. did too. So now, do you like Dak? As is he? Do you think he's the franchise the way to go? Yeah, I think so. I think when he comes back and he gets healed from his injury, I think he'll be. Uh, I think he'll pick up right where he left off, and I, I think do, we'll we'll bounce back. He's got such a good uh, leadership mentality, and like just him being in the playoffs a lot of the times, he's shown what he's capable of. I know there's a lot of criticism that gets thrown his way, but I think he's yeah. a definitely franchise quarterback, no doubt. So yeah. Cool, man. So, uh, yeah. So how I always start these off is the first question I ask is as a fan, what was the first indie show you attended? Oh, so the, the very first indie show I attended was in 1998. Okay. It was, uh, in a bar here in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I believe the main event was, uh, the fabulous Moola wrestling one of the local radio DJs here, a guy by the name of Jeff Roper. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was actually the first time I met the guy that would go on to train me, Bob Keller, uh, because Bob was actually on that show uh, tagging with his uh, with his old tag team partner. So, um, yeah, I don't really remember a lot about it because I was only like, I don't know, 10 years old, maybe at the time. That sounds great. Right. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. How old are you right now. Oh, I'm 33. OK, because so. my that was my first indie show was 98 too, June of 1998. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I got back into the indie scene right before I started training. I went to a promotion called CWA here in Columbia uh, at the Jamil Temple. And, I mean, there was a, a litany of names on that show. I mean, Rhino, uh, Rick Steiner, um, Rikishi. Uh, there was just a bunch of, uh, bunch of household names on the show. Uh, but it was also like the, the, indie uh, the indie talent at the time were the ones that really brought me back because they were all like just busting their asses and um, really putting on a spectacular show trying to get noticed. So uh, that's where I really started noticing guys like, you know, Malachi and Josh Magnum and Timber. And uh, these are names that diehard South Carolina indie fans, yeah. or Carolina indie fans might remember, but uh, those are the kind of guys that, that kept me coming back. So. And like, it's talk about the, the Carolina indie scene overall. Is it like, what what kind of fan dynamic is it going on? I know I'm I'm from Pittsburgh, so we got a lot of mixtures of like you know families and stuff like that. But also like a lot of hipsters are kind of getting interesting a lot. I've seen and it's just like it, maybe not even previous fans in a lot of ways. So how's the dynamic there? Has it has it changed over the course of time since you attended as a fan and now you're working? It's, it, it's definitely changed. I always think that there's going to be a huge stigma when it comes to Southern wrestling fans. Like they're like they're dumb or they're uneducated. And I think that's further from the truth than people can imagine, because I think some of the smartest fans are here in the Carolinas and uh, they're definitely some of the smartest and definitely some of the most passionate as well. I think in terms of dynamic, you get more families uh, and kids in South Carolina and then you get more diehard, smarter fans, hipsters, as you say, uh, in North Carolina. And I think that's a weird dynamic. But um, I think that's kind of the case. I think you see more of your smarter type crowd in North Carolina and, you know, more families looking to just be entertained and have a good time in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like North Carolina is like the heart of, uh, you know, flair country and all that stuff. So <laughs> you can't a lot be of, a lot of wrestling heritage and history in both North and South Carolina. And then it just, yeah, transfers on over, like the, from generation to generation, like the talents that come out of there from Shane Helms to the Hardy Boys, the list goes on, man. It's, it's, uh, and now you look at the generation now, you got FTR, you've got Cedric Alexander, you've got 
uh, so many other guys that have come out of this area that are just killing it right now. So, yeah. Yeah. And like, that's some fascinating thing. And I talked to you about the, this tea off the air is like, uh, how I got onto you is like the Mike Mooneyham column. And, uh, that was just in this last, uh, Sunday's edition of the post and Curie, Right. So, yeah, uh, correct. Yeah. And, um, so how the next question I asked typically, th these are all kind of just basic is like, and I think I'm for me to the column, I might have a hunch of who it might be, but who was the first baby face that got you hooked as a wrestler? And then who was the, your first heel that got you hooked as a fan? I mean, I'm sorry, as a fan, as a fan. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. That's a, that's a tough question. I would, I would probably go with, um, man, you know, it's hard to beat some of Bret Hart's baby face stuff in the early nineties. Uh, he was just having great matches with everybody. And uh, he was really somebody that, kind of caught my eye and attention as a, as a kid. Cause I thought he looked cool. He had the shades, he, you know, wore the pink and black, he had the long hair, had the leather jacket, you know, there was, he was just so cool. And uh, you know, for, for me, it would have been Brett probably. And then I guess the first heel that I probably would have noticed ironically enough would have been Sean Michaels. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I remember watching the early episodes of Monday night raw and Mr. Perfect and Sean Michaels getting like a fight in the streets of New York city. And, and perfect throwing Michaels to the windshield of a car. And I just, my jaw dropped as a kid. I was like, what is going on? Who are these guys with mullets and, and, and windbreakers? And why are they beating the, why are they beating the piss out of each other in the street? So like <laughs> my, my curiosity was just, you know, at an all time high. And I don't think I ever stopped watching after that, that first episode of uh, raw that I caught. So it's, uh, it's pretty, so you'd pretty much say you're a WWE kid growing up for the most part. I was, you know, and, and, to be fair, like I got all the magazines. I tried to watch everything that I could. So it's kind of hard to say. I think I swing more towards the WWF, WWE, mm -hmm. but WCW was always came to town uh, here oh, in Columbia. Yeah. They used to always run the township auditorium. So a lot of the live events that I went to as a kid were all WCW shows. So it's kind of hard to pick one over the other. But, uh, you know, I definitely, I mean, gun to my head, I'd probably say I was more of a WWF kid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? I mean, like growing up at that time, I always feel it's a, like a really good time to be a kid, like as a wrestling fan, like is well, the nineties in general. Yeah. Everything was so cool in the nineties. You know, it's, it seems to always be that way. The generation after you doesn't know what they missed out on previously. Yeah. And so yeah, for me, I think the best time to ever be a kid was in the nineties, but yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely with wrestling. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's crazy, man. I, and I'm a big fan of everything. Uh, and I still try to watch as much wrestling as I can, but it's, it comes a little becomes a little more difficult these days. Absolutely, it does. Like, and I can only imagine too, from a you know a working perspective too, in that regard. Like, it's tough to balance life and doing all that stuff. Um, yeah. What? So you mentioned Bob Keller, and he was your first trainer. Um, is uh, how? So and you he was at your the the first live show you were at. How did uh, you get sparked? Was there like a certain moment that sparked you to, to kind of get into wrestling that stands out? Or was it just a gradual thing that you always kind of wanted, knew you wanted to do? Uh, it was, I think it was always the, the pipe dream as a kid that I was mm -hmm. going to one day be a wrestler. I always, you know, wanted to do it. I always had a big imagination as a kid. So I was constantly, you know, booking dream match cards and, uh, you know, writing them out on paper and, and drawing out what my outfit would look like and, you know, all sorts of just weird stuff like that. And, you know, playing wrestling sometimes by myself with my wrestling buddies and just all sorts of weird things. But um, yeah, I think right around 2007, when I was going to some of the indie shows here locally, my interest was really peaked and I saw some of the guys and, you know, I always thought I was too small to be a wrestler, you know, and I mean, I'm five, seven, five, eight, you know, at the time I was maybe 180 pounds. And so I was always kind of told that maybe I'd be too small to be a wrestler. Uh, but then I saw some of the guys on some of these indie shows and I was like, ah, if that guy can do it. I can definitely give it a try. Yeah. And I was in college at the time at the university of South Carolina while I was getting a degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with life as most college kids, believe it or not, kind of go through that state of depression or influx where they don't know what they want to do exactly. Yeah. So I said, well, why not? I'm 20 years old. I might as well try it and see if it works. And if it doesn't, at least I can say I tried and me trying turned into a, a budding 13 year career now. So. Um, been very fortunate now did you just what like did you think of Bob Keller in your mind when you were gonna do it or did you kind of uh kind of like do some searching and then you it kind of stumbled you stumbled upon him once again after seeing him 
Yeah. So it's kind of a funny story because uh, as I was going to some of those indie shows, I started helping set up the ring and mm-hmm. putting out the chairs and stuff like that. And I wasn't obligated to, I wasn't on the show. I wasn't with the company or anything like that. It was just me trying to help out my local indie show. Yeah. Um, and so then after a couple of times of doing that, one of the guys, um, uh, Timber, the insane lumberjack, uh, he uh, asked me, he was like, Hey kid, you want to get in the ring and try this? And I was like, hell yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, I actually got in the ring with Timber a couple times before shows, but the way things work, not to peel the curtain back too much. Uh, but you know, a lot of guys need the ring before the shows to, to warm up, to train and all sorts of stuff like that. So there were a lot of times I wouldn't get a lot of ring time before the shows. So I started asking around, like, where are, what are some of the more reputable schools around here? And everybody I asked, everything came up Bob Keller. So uh, the name didn't really sound familiar in my head. Uh-huh. Uh, and then the first day I went to school, I was like, you know, damn, this, this guy looks familiar. Like, I know him from somewhere. And ironically enough, I got a Polaroid picture with him that day in 1998. Really? And uh, I went back home and I kind of was looking through my wrestling memorabilia and I found the Polaroid and I was like, that's where this guy, I knew this guy from somewhere. (laughs) So uh, it kind of, it's just a small world type thing where things kind of come full circle. So, and I still have the Polaroid picture. So um, great, man. That's great. Oh yeah. That's gotta be cool. That's gotta be a cool thing to have. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So uh, when, how long until when you were training, when you got through the process of it more so like that, did you start kind of figuring like, man, I could, I'm pretty decent at this and I could really make this a career and make a run at it. Was there a certain moment that stood out or is that, well, is that another? There's some, there's some days I still argue on whether or not I'm decent at this or not. Um, yeah. I think but, that's a good uh, thing though, ultimately to think that way, you know? Cause yeah, it keeps going. yeah. I think what I had going for me, if anything, was the fact that I did grow up such a big fan, like watching it from the time I was four or five years old up until, you know, 18, 19, 20, you, you know, once you get a little older, you get a little wiser and you kind of start figuring it out on your own. You're like, okay, there's a certain way some of this stuff works. And, um, you know, through the advent of things like tough enough and, you know, things like that, you know, it was very easy for me to think about what those people were doing and kind of apply it when I first started training. And so I really picked up on everything pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was, I wouldn't say, you know, I was a natural or anything like that. I definitely had to work at it, but, um, I, I really picked up on everything pretty quickly and I only trained for like three or four months. Uh, cause I started, I want to say in like April of 2008 mm-hmm. and I had my first match in July of 2008. So it wasn't very long at all before I was ready to have my first match. Wow. Wow. So, uh, how was that going into your first match? Uh, who was it against? And, uh, yeah, what was the, the kind of mentality you had, I guess, going in and how did you feel after the fact that it was all said and done? Well, I answered the second part of the question first. Uh, okay. I was ecstatic afterwards. Uh, like it was better than Christmas. It was better than like my first kiss. Uh, it was better than, you know, everything. Like it was just amazing. Uh, and I remember like texting all my friends and telling them like, I just had my first wrestling match and it was awesome. And yada, yada, yada. Uh, in reality, I went to a show with Bob Keller, uh, mm-hmm. helped set up the ring, put out the chairs and, glorious beautiful big bear lake west virginia and uh um i actually got thrown on at the last minute because a bunch of guys no showed or they couldn't make it for whatever reason so i wrestled a guy by the name of the one man warning bill bain Mm -hmm. and uh got beat about three minutes i uh didn't have any wrestling gear uh so i had to borrow gear from literally all the guys in the back like uh you know one dude gave me his uh you know you know, trunks to wear. Another dude gave me his knee pads. Another dude gave me boots. What? Literally, I'm just picking. Yeah, like everybody's. <laughs> yeah, everybody's just loaning me all this stuff. I look like one of the created wrestler or creator wrestlers from, uh, you know, like No Mercy or something. No like Mercy, just right? Th- yeah, just this thrown together outfit, and you know, I was just a Jay Brown and got beat in three minutes. But you know, it was still like the best three minutes of my life. So, and was, so you, you didn't even have expectations that you were going to wrestle at all going into that, too, huh? No, literally, I drove up or rode up with Bob to help him sell his merch and, like I said, help put out the chairs and set up the ring and stuff like that. And as I was selling merch before the show, Bob comes up to me and he goes, hey, kid, are you nervous? And I'm sitting there counting money and, you know, making like these sales and stuff. And I go, no, why would I be nervous? And he goes, well, I'd be nervous if I was third match. And I go, (laughs) seriously? And he goes, yeah, follow me. And like he took me 
like around the back of the building where everybody was changing and all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, but I don't even have any gear. Like, and he goes, well, we're going to find you gear and you're ready. Don't worry about it. And so, um, that kind of put my nerves at ease a little bit. And, and Bill, the guy that I worked with, Bill Bain, he was, he was great. He was a total pro totally took care of me. And, you know, thank gosh you did because like, you know, if he would have gone out there and taken liberties, liberties with me or beat me up because I was new, you know, who's to say I would still be around. So right. um, very thankful for just the way things happen sometimes. Yeah, that's another like serendipitous thing that I think it's, you know, just like and you hear that so many times about wrestlers is like just going to shows and putting your time in and like your opportunity comes and it's kind of neat that it just came up that way for you. So that's pretty, yeah. sweet, man. pretty sweet. Um, yeah. So now once you started getting uh, ring work and everything like that um and i think again from the mooneyham article i might have an idea well it actually i think it kind of stated it in a way who are some of your the styles that you took from and uh adapted to once you started getting a basis for a foundation of you know your core core strengths and weaknesses in the ring and stuff like that who who did you kind of pick and choose from so to speak well like anything when you first start you have an idea of what you want to be and mm -hmm. so you think it's going to be that way forever. And then you slowly learn that you have to evolve and adapt and change and stay fresh and all that kind of stuff. But uh, when I first started, I really obviously wanted to be like Shawn Michaels. I wanted to be like uh, Chris Jericho and Mr. Perfect and, you know, Bret Hart, all these guys that I really looked up to. And then the, 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 the more that I went on in my career, I kind of realized like, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest guy. I'm not the most athletic. So I got to find a style that works for me. And then I really started diving deep into people like Arn Anderson, mm -hmm. Tully Blanchard. And then when I started going to Europe, I really started taking a liking to like Fit Finley's style of wrestling, uh, William Regal. Uh, so in a weird way, like all these guys in a, in a weird way have had such an influence on my career. And, you know, it's crazy because now on a bi-weekly basis, when we're taping TV down in Jacksonville, like, I'm around Chris Jericho all the time. I'm around Arn Anderson. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys have become mentors of mine and it's just a surreal thing that here they are, you know, guys that I patterned myself after or tried to anyways. And now I'm sitting here having conversations with them on a regular basis. So yeah, picking their brain and stuff like that. I can only imagine, you know? Yeah. Um, no, I, it was neat. Cause I, uh, before we did, we had this interview, I watched uh, just a, the brief match you had with Billy Gunn on dark. And I, I just, and then I read the reread the article again, and I was like, wow, like I'm seeing uh, some Jerry Lynn, a lot of Jerry Lynn I felt to your vibe. So yeah, it was. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, think that's fun. That's funny because me and Jerry have become travel partners. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yeah, he's my he's my. We call each other our road wives now. But yeah, Jerry's <laughs> become, and Jerry's a guy that never will get the credit that he deserves. Yeah. Um, he's really somebody that should be talked about when they talk about ushering in the cruiserweight style of wrestling. Uh, you know, the matches he had with Sean Waltman, X-Pac, uh, you know, and, and Jerry's like, if there was a best supporting wrestler, like Academy Award, it would be Jerry Lynn hands down would win it because he so many like guys will tell you, <laughs> so many like guys will tell you, that, yeah, 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 so many guys will tell you that they had their best matches with Jerry Lynn, so, mm -hmm. um, and so he's, uh, that's, I'd say that is a tremendous compliment, so thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. No, uh, Jerry's been a favorite of mine for a long time, and he's actually was my first ever interview in general, so it was oh nice, was like, such a feather in the cap. I'm like, dude, I can't believe my first ever wrestling interview was with Jerry Lynn, so, uh, and yeah, no, seeing that, I thought it was pretty cool. I was like, man, just the way you moved in there, I kind of just got a Jerry Lynn vibe from it, so, cool. um, yeah, as far as, now, you're the, the Southern Savior, um, where did you pick and choose a lot of your persona from? And how would you say from it for a new fan, how would you describe like who you are as a wrestler from a persona perspective, I guess? Uh, it's interesting enough. A lot of it that I, stuff that I pulled from came from two characters. Uh, one Tyler Durden from fight club. Yep. Uh, you know, just the, the idea of uh, project mayhem and, you know, we're going to destroy everything to create something better. Um, that was kind of the, the mentality behind the Tyler Durden character. So I kind of, that kind of resonated with me. And then also uh, David Koresh, um, the idea of what he was as a human being and as a, as a person and the way he could, you know, uh, influence people with words. And he was articulate and he was a good speaker. And, you know, he was just cerebral and, all these things. And I think that always appealed to me in movies and TV, like 
some of my favorite villains were always the smartest. Yeah. Um, and being that I am college educated, you know, I'm not a dummy. Um, that, that was something I always wanted to incorporate. Like I never wanted to be like a, just a meathead or a dummy or uh, a guy that constantly trips over his own feet or anything like that. I wanted to be somebody that people go, God, this guy's smart. Like, yeah. you know, so that's kind of the, the, the background of the character. If I was able to describe it, I would just say like, uh, in a way it's a guy that could make empty promises uh, and you, you kind of question him. Yeah. Kind of question his motives, but uh, he has everything and all the tools to back it up. So yeah. I would definitely say like the big word, overlying, underlying, whatever word is cerebral. Uh, yeah. Very smart, articulate, bad guy. See, like almost kind of like a like a snake oil salesman in a way. Would you kind of say where it's just like you're you kind of yeah. manipulate manipulate. So and, it, and if I had to point to a wrestler, I would probably say like Jake Roberts when he was a yeah. villain. In, in like 91, 92 or, you know, WWF again, but uh, just the whole like, uh, you know, him saying, trust me all the time. Just trust yeah. me. Trust yeah. me. And I was just, there's something always, always so cool about that. It just, you know, gives you goosebumps and makes your hair stand up and everything like that. So do you ever see the uh, FX show Justified uh, with uh, Not- it's like Railing Givens? It's like a, it's takes place in Kentucky. But uh, the guy's like a U.S. Marshal. But there's a character named Boyd Crowder who's very much like that. And he's very yeah. – he kind of jumps from thing to thing and has a different persona that, uh, you know, uh, he's very manipulative with a lot of people. Almost he gets like a cult following going. It's kind of – so like that kind of aspect. Yeah, having that smart, uh, you know, kind of heelish dynamic is, is a neat balance to have for a wrestler. And I think always – and, you know, the per- person like you as an individual or whoever it may be that goes into it, I think adds an extra element to it. Like, obviously it's own unique element. So um, going to, uh, you mentioned the outside influence, like so that's a very cool outside influence. How about like from a perspective of like when you do promos or uh, anything to that extent, is there a certain people you kind of draw from there, whether it's from wrestling or uh, outside of wrestling too, or th- would those kind of be one the same as well, like Tyler Durden and uh, who you Yeah, mentioned? I would say those are the a big part of the influence that both Tyler Durden, the character, and David Koresh, the human being, have yeah. over me is comes through in the promos yeah. um, 100%. And uh, are there uh, certain wrestlers that I draw from? You know, yeah, there's that influence from Jake yep. where he kind of talked very quietly and didn't yell and scream all the time. And, you know, uh, uh, recently I've kind of tweaked a couple things. Uh, I've added a more of a sleazy factor to it. Uh, uh, like I said, empty promises earlier. I couldn't help but go back and watch a lot of JBL promos where JBL, uh, you know, was uh, really speaking to the audience. And he, it didn't feel like he was ever cutting a promo. It looked like he was just speaking to an audience. And uh, I think there's something that's so, so rare because it always so many times nowadays you see guys and it looks like they're reciting a promo or something from memory. And with JBL, it was always a little bit different. That character, especially he always seemed like he was speaking to the audience. Um, And then another one is Jericho when uh, he was kind of doing the, uh, the, the suits and serious, serious Jericho. (laughs) Yeah. He was doing the suits kind of Nick Bockwinkle esque uh, using big words and, uh things of that nature um so those are kind of like my wrestling influences in terms of promos and you know what you know and that's the thing too i think i think when i always see a wrestler uh, whether it's interview or like via like television or whatever i feel like a lot of that uh just having uh the outside influence is such a big part of it like not like obviously like having inspirations from wrestlers like other talent and stuff like that is great but i think like once you bring not only yourself into it but outside influence is so important i feel i think it's yeah and and now especially more than ever just because everything in wrestling has kind of been done already right so mm-hmm. it's 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 hard to do something original in wrestling now um and so it's all the more you can pull from outside things i think the better yeah no absolutely um so uh, part of the big article too, the, the feature of the article was you you worked matches uh, with AEW on dark and stuff like that. And up until June, and then you got injured and like, it was like freak accident kind of thing happened. And uh, you were tagging with Bradley Pierce, correct? And then uh, Brady, Brady, Brady Pierce. Pierce. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And then you were going yeah. up against the dark order. Um, talk about that happening 
and then uh, we'll we'll kind of go into that after a little bit more into that. Just talk about that experience, like just the match itself, and and all how that all unfolded a little bit. Yeah, so I think for all the wrestlers lately, it's been hard getting used to wrestling in front of no people, and now I think it's good that we're letting a limited capacity of fans back in slowly to shows uh, because I don't think any of us will ever take the fans for granted ever again, because this is a hard sport, a hard business to do without wrestling fans. And I think mentally you, you kind of think about that because it kind of hard, it's hard to get your adrenaline up mm -hmm. uh, when there's no people. And so I think you become more susceptible to being injured. Um, and sometimes when we're, when we're taping dark, you know, we don't start dark until after dynamite. So sometimes we're not going to the ring until 11, 11 30, 12 o'clock. Uh, last week we went to the ring at 2 AM. Like, and that's just makes for a long night slash morning. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard to, you know, stay grounded or in a, in a, in the right mindset that you need to, to not get injured. Uh, yeah, it was just a freak thing. Uh, went to make a, a tag and I rolled underneath a clothesline as I rolled underneath the clothesline from, uh, from evil Uno, uh, the, the upper part of his quad just clipped the bottom of my foot and it just kind of caused my leg to kind of shoot off to the side. Yeah. And that's where everything kind of went snap, crackle, pop. And, uh, you know, I didn't even realize I had torn anything. Um, I just was worried about how it was going to look. And so, you know, I finished the match. I, mm -hmm. I, wrestled another two or three minutes and uh, uh, blew a big comeback and did all this stuff that I probably shouldn't have been able to do. And um, I just thought I had like a bad cramp or a Charlie horse, or maybe it was just a little tweaked or whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, as soon as I got to the back, they, you know, I couldn't walk anymore and they put me on the table in the medical room and they pretty much knew right away that I'd at least torn my ACL oh, man. when got an MRI the next day. And um uh, it was MCL, ACL, and PCL. So it was a trifecta. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I can't stress enough how good AEW has been to me uh, in the timeout uh, and how great, you know, and gracious their medical team has been and the patience that they've had with me. Uh, Doc Sampson, uh, uh, Brad, Bryce, and, and um, Trent all on the team there. Uh, they've all taken great care of me. So, yeah. And, uh, it's got to be like, yeah, kind of like that opportunity to, to do that, to have those matches and then kind of it going away for that time being, it had to be like, and you mentioned it in the article too, how like it was an adjustment for you and like doing, and not only from a physical perspective, obviously, but like the mental perspective. And plus you have COVID on top of that, the pandemic coming into play. Talk about your experience of just having that downtime and, and mentally working through it, as well as like the, the physical therapy that took for you to get back to where you're at right now. Oh, well, it sucked. It was terrible. Um, yeah. uh, especially those first couple of weeks. I mean, there was a pretty bad state of depression knowing that the one thing that I had as an outlet during all this uh, wrestling uh, was taken from me. And yeah. so uh, it was a tough pill to swallow. And there was a lot of downtime sitting at home. And I started feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, what am I going to do now? Um, type of deal, like just you know, can't go to the gym and work out because can't walk. I need knee surgery. So um, can't wrestle, obviously. So many things that you can't do because COVID shut everything down. So literally all I had time to do was sit around. And instead of feeling sorry for myself, I said, you know what, I'm going to start coming up with some ideas. And literally with a notebook paper and a pen, started writing out promo ideas and ideas for vignettes. And, you know, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I dropped the video midnight new year's eve uh kind of announcing my return and that was the thing that i wrote on notebook paper and it you know started up here and put it out on paper and got it shot and filmed with a great crew of guys and uh then it materialized and i think in the first day it had over ten thousand views just on twitter alone which isn't bad no that's i mean really i don't know if that's good or i don't know if that's good or bad but knowing that it came from from here and I put it on paper and then it materialized into what it materialized to you know that was a rewarding feeling for sure and that's where I'm trying to spend most of my energy now is putting it back into ideas and coming up with with, with things like that that are creative and uh, or creatively uh, stimulating to me yeah uh, and that was uh, a, an outlet 
or became an outlet for me to, to kind of get through all the eight months of hell um, that I had with the, with the physical therapy and everything else. Yeah. And you know, um, did you kind of find yourself too? Like you mentioned that doing that promo and stuff, did you find like, I mean, I hear about this all the time and obviously it's a, such a huge aspect now is the social media aspect of wrestling and like people, that's how they get a lot of their content out. Did you find that kind of almost to be the silver lining of having this downtime is being able to utilize some of that stuff to kind of showcase yourself in a lot of ways when you're not able to do it in the ring? Uh, so I did take a bit of a break from social media simply because um, I kind of wanted to completely go away for a little while. So people, I mean, the people that, you know, obviously knew that I was hurt, you know, and then I kind of wanted them to forget about me, maybe speculate a little bit. Yeah. Where's he been? When's he coming back? Uh, it's the old saying of, if you don't go away, we can't miss you. Right. And so, you know, I know I have at least, you know, anywhere from six to eight months of uh, downtime. So I try to spend my time and energy and other things away from social media. And then about the time that I was going to drop this video, mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of worked out in my favor where I was going to get cleared right around the new year. So I was like, I think new year's day or new year's Eve would be the perfect time to drop this at midnight yeah. because so many people get on social media and they talk about, Oh, 2021 is going to be my year. It's going to be my year. Well, in the video, I claim it's going to be our year. And again, it's the Southern Savior kind of coming back. And, nice, yeah. uh, you know, what better place or time to drop it than midnight on New Year's Eve? Because how many people are on Twitter saying Happy New Year? You know, it was uh, essentially the, the video became my my me welcoming everyone to 2021. Yeah. And also announcing my return in the process and dropping a new t-shirt which is now available and people can contact me directly if they want to buy one hey we'll get the, yeah we'll get to, we'll make sure we plug that at the end um so yeah and from that uh i think it's uh going yeah this is what i wanted to cover too is um you're you were originally a teacher right was that your backup plan for uh this yes i had a teaching degree and uh, i taught part-time for about seven years on the side while wrestling so uh and i you know, I was a substitute teacher. I was a tutor. Uh, I worked in an afternoon program. I did a lot of different things at, at a private school. And uh, so that was, yes, that was my backup plan. And now, thankfully, I haven't had to utilize that in over a year now. So I think things are going pretty well. That's yeah, pretty solid, man. Um, is there certain aspects you've taken from that, though, into the ring or into your pro wrestling career in a lot of ways? Is there certain things that you found beneficial from doing that? to taking it, yeah, to the career you want to do ultimately? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously preparing to be a teacher uh, gave me a lot of uh, patience because mm -hmm. uh, you have to have patience with students, uh, especially kids when they act up. Yep. But also, you know, it, it, that patience, I think, is what translated into me being successful because in, in our business, in pro wrestling, it's, it's tough to be patient. Uh, because you want everything and you want everything right now. And uh, that's just not how it works sometimes. I mean, very few times are you going to find a rock or a Goldberg or whoever that becomes an overnight success. It just doesn't happen that way anymore. So uh, I learned to be very patient. And I think that crossed over. And again, just relying back on, you know, just some of the things I w learned while in, in college, just things about vocabulary, things about speaking, how to talk to people, how to speak not only to kids, but to parents. Well, guess what? That sounds like a wrestling promo because right. I have to have a wide demographic that I'm reaching while, while speaking. So um, things like that definitely crossed over for sure. Yeah. Oh, and that's, yeah. Patience is such a big thing. Cause a lot of, you're right. Like today in today's day and age of the need of immediacy and, and like how everything's at everybody's fingertips too so many times you don't get what you want immediately and you just got to kind of wait it out right out the wave. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So how, what I else I usually do is, um, and this is something I've been doing with not just meet the wrestler, but interviews overall is I, I kind of like one of the things I close it out with is like, so I've been cultivating like a music playlist and I feel, uh, what I do for each wrestler is I ask them now it can be any three songs you want, but, what three songs, it, it could be ones you're currently listening to, or uh, it's just some classic ones that are always in your rotation, so to speak. But when you're working out, what are three workout playlists, play songs you would uh, have while you're working out? Yeah. 
man, that's tough. Um, three work. Uh, wow. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, like Southern rock, obviously. So, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, Leonard Skinner is always going to be a good too. So I'd probably say like, maybe give me back my bullets by Leonard Skinner. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, uh, also a big kiss fan. So maybe, uh, maybe love it loud by kiss. All right. Uh, and then the last one, uh, Ooh, there's so many good ones. There's ACDC, Metallica. Uh, ugh. Man, you really put me on the spot. Um, I know. I've done it. Like, I've done this to a couple of guys. And they're just like, oh, man, I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, truthfully, and it's, you know, obviously, again, it goes back to wrestling in a weird way, but I'm a big Fozzie fan. Uh, yeah. So I would probably say, I'm not going to say Judas because that's played on TV every week. So I'll, uh, I'll say maybe uh nowhere to run by Fozzie. oh okay nice nice man there you go yeah i like it the, three off the top of my head i like it man uh you talked about like yeah and i saw this in the article too your dream match uh like ultimately on your goal list is uh going against jericho um how has it been like having him you kind of touched upon it already a little bit but how has it been like him kind of being in that like you know uh, uh, an ear to bend so to speak has it been pretty beneficial overall you feel and like what, what's a big takeaway from it? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, Chris didn't get to really know me that well until I got injured. And then okay, me and Chris slowly, you know, were around each other more and more and hanging out and stuff like that every week. And, um, you know, he's been great. Like he was super, uh, again, gracious, like always giving me a well wishes and, you know, saying like, Hey, I can't wait to see you back in the ring and you know i know you're gonna do great when you come back and believe it or not when i dropped the promo on 2021 uh you know one of the guys that reached out to me was chris nice. uh and he you know he messaged me asked me a couple questions like what is what is it what is it all about and i kind of gave him the backstory on it and he said it was the great it was a great nucleus or, or core of an idea for me to come back and he was really excited to see how i'm going to expand upon it when i return so and we all know chris jericho uh, one of the things he was known for was his uh, vignettes. Yep. Uh, whether he was debuting or returning or, or what, he always did it in grandiose fashion. So um, <laughs> he's he's uh, a good one to to, to kind of lean on in that regard. Um, but yeah, he's been great. Um, a, a lot of the conversations we have sometimes have nothing to do with wrestling, but we've had a lot of good laughs, and I think that's what I, I'm going to appreciate the most. Um, uh, especially when, when wrestling is all said and done and my career is over, I, I think I'm going to more so appreciate the time with the, with the boys and the, and the girls in the locker room than that I actually will maybe anything I've actually done in the ring. So I could only imagine that because I mean, even just from like being on like organized sports, like a team or anything like that, you get that vibe of like camaraderie and the brotherhood or sisterhood that goes on there. And, uh, but the fact that like you guys are working together, it's like, takes two to tango so to speak so like you're not only working together in the ring but you guys are on the road together and doing all that stuff it's a it's such a unique business and i think that's one of the most coolest things about wrestling is that aspect of it of, of being like with several people and running in and like you mentioned it coming full circle too with you and bob keller and everything i think there, there's just so many neat elements to that and um ultimately like yeah when you look back on it i'm sure as a career and everything and uh, see it it's going to be pretty satisfying. I think, you know, it's gotta be, you know, <laughs> you can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And again, uh, another guy that's become a mentor of mine lately is Arn Anderson. And I think one of the things that he tells me all the time that, you know, I haven't really thought about is I haven't really had a significant run anywhere yet on television, but uh, the 13 years of hard work and experience that I've had uh, is so satisfying. I mean, I've gotten to travel the world. A lot of the friends that I have now, most of all of them are I met through wrestling, Mm -hmm. uh, the prior relations, uh, relationships that I've had, you know, I met those women through wrestling, uh, you know, so there's a lot of good things that wrestling's giving me over the years. And the thing that Arn says is, you know, you haven't even had your big run yet. And he goes, now when your big run happens, uh, not only will you appreciate it, but you're going to be ready and prepared. And so I'm excited for that big run. Yeah, absolutely, man. Is there, um, now, short term is there any like short term goals that you have aren't you you're returning coming back this is it january 30th that you're going up against eric young correct yeah this saturday in lions georgia for lariato pro wrestling uh 
I will be taking on uh, former Impact Wrestling champion, current Lariato Pro heavyweight champion, Eric Young, mm-hmm. uh, in Lyons, Georgia. I know there's plenty of seats still available if people hear this and they are in driving distance of Lyons, Georgia. Uh, they can come on out this Saturday. Uh, and then, you know, next week, um, you know, people might see me pop up on AEW Dark again for the first time in eight months. So uh, I won't give it away just yet, but, uh, you know, people can be looking, be on the lookout for that coming up shortly. Oh, yeah, man. No, it will be good to see you back in the mix. Um, Yeah, you got quite the presence about you. And especially when I read that piece by Mike Manningham, I was like, this is definitely a unique person that I got to get a hold of. So, yeah, thanks for joining me today, man. Um, It's uh, always fascinating to get to learn a basis and give uh, get a background of somebody that's up and coming. And like you've been established for 13 years going and it's going to be very cool to see the trajectory the rest of your career takes, brother. Yeah, I mean, I taught uh, we opened it up with number four being yep. my favorite number. Uh, maybe 13 will be my new favorite number because I think it's going to be the best year that I've had yet in wrestling. So um, thank you for having me on and uh, I'd love to come back anytime you want to have me. Absolutely, man. No, I absolutely. Well, I'd definitely love to have you on again. Um, what, so how do they follow you on social media uh, and anything else you want to put your t-shirt and everything, website, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, people can follow me at the John Schuyler. It's S K Y L E R on Twitter and Instagram. I uh, have a YouTube channel. Uh, people can go on there, check out old matches, old promos, uh, new promos. Uh, they can check out the 2021 video that I talked about on here that was dropped on midnight of New Year's Eve. Uh, and, uh, yeah, if people want to buy sh- um, uh, T-shirts, new or old. Uh, you know, I have the brand-new 2021 T-shirt that just dropped and just came out. Those are flying off the shelves. I just sent out a whole bunch of pre-orders yesterday. Uh, which was a fun way to spend my day off. So um, at the post office and uh, uh, who doesn't want to uh, spend your day at the post office. Yeah, but it's well worth it if you're putting smiles on people's faces. So um, yeah, people can uh, purchase those shirts directly through me uh, because they're not available yet on pro wrestling tees, but pro wrestling tees does have uh, some of my older merchandise still available. If uh, fans want to go on there and buy a shirt from pro wrestling tees. Heck yeah, man. Heck yeah. Well, cool. John, thanks for joining me. And uh, everybody, this is Dominic D'Angelo. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Dominic D'Angelo. You can follow WrestleZone on Twitter at WrestleZoneCom. And then go to WrestleZone.com for all your writing, wrestling news needs. So there you go. John, thanks so much again, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right.